getting started. Good evening, everyone. We are recording um, this uh, annual meeting for posterity's sake. My name is Chris Wiley, and it has been my honor and privilege to serve as the Tulsa Global Alliance board chair for the past 12 months. It simultaneously feels like, uh, I don't know, six weeks and three years all at once, all the time, sort of the uh, uh, role of eternal return, if you will. Um, but it has been a, uh, a real honor to work alongside um, TGA's volunteers, host families, uh, board members, donors, supporters, friends in the corporate sector, and of, and of course the staff. Um, so I will officially call this meeting to order. Um, we do have a number of business items to attend to right uh, from the start, as well as uh, we're honored to be joined um, by uh, our speaker from the U.S. Institute of Peace, so stay tuned for that. Um, but before we go any further, um, I do want to just take a moment um, and recognize that there is someone very important to so many of us who is uh, not uh, not here this evening, and that is longtime TGA staffer Kathy Izzo, um, who passed away uh, after a nearly two decade long career with the organization um, earlier this spring. Um, it's been a tough few months um, for so many of us, uh, I very much include myself in that, um, because Kathy leaves such a legacy of citizen diplomacy and of um, loving thy neighbor and so, so many other uh, traits and qualities that you would want from a colleague and a friend. Um, Kathy uh, exhibited those in spades and she's very missed this evening. Um, please continue to keep her family and your, your thoughts and your prayers, um, but know that her memory and legacy lives on in the work of this organization and many of the things and many of uh, TJ's accomplishments that you'll hear about later tonight are the direct result of tireless years of work from Kathy. Um, and I could probably spend the whole next hour running through all of those, but uh, she would not want that. She would want the organization to continue and press on. So please do keep her in mind throughout the entirety of today's program as a true model of what a citizen diplomat should be. So. Um, that being said, I will now transition us into uh, the business portion of this meeting. The main item of which is for us to vote on and receive new members onto the TGA Board of Directors. Um, so for the past several months, we've had a nominating committee develop the board slate um, that you all will be voting on this evening. So I would like the nominating committee chair and immediate past chair of the TGA board, Eric Hunkel, um, to please present the committee's recommendations for the year. Eric. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, whichever, depending upon where you're, you're participating. Um, as, as Chris stated, I'm uh, an ex officio member of the board the last year as the immediate past president. And then I, I did serve uh, two terms on the board starting in 2015. So this is probably my last official board uh, function this evening. And I was honored to be um, the nominating committee chair. Uh, a little over a month ago, um, all the members were sent the board slate, which I hopefully you can all see on your screen. Um, so this is what the nominating committee is proposing to be your incoming board members for the year beginning July 1. Um, but as the uh, bylaw protocols state, we also take um, any nominations from the floor. So if anyone um, in attendance would like to nominate somebody in addition to this board slate, please do so right now. Um, Hearing none, I'd take a motion that the nominations cease. Could I have that motion? I'll make that motion, Eric. All right, could uh, I have a second, please? 
Thank you, Kathy. So let the record show that the nominations are closed. Um, so we'd like to have, a, I don't know exactly how we're doing voting. Are we doing this in the chat, um, gentlemen? Um, so we'd like to have a, have a motion in favor of the board slate presented. I don't know if we're doing that in the chat. So I'd be happy for any instruction there. Um, or for Eric, any... I'm going to launch a poll here in just a All second. Right. Okay. okay, thank you so much. So I've just launched a poll for voting on the board slate. We'll wait for results to come in there. And then right afterwards, I'll launch a poll for the uh, officers, the executive committee. I regret to inform you that the virtual band we had hired to fill the dead <laughs> air between our votes <laughs> failed to materialize this evening. Um, it was actually just four chat bots that had been programmed to respond to each other in harmony, but you know, can't always be perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate everybody's patience. The the vote for the board slate is in and we've got 23 votes in favor and no none opposed so let the record reflect that the board slate proposed by the nominating committee is hereby um, installed by this body for the forthcoming year and then i think bob is there's there's a, a subset of that that is going to be the executive the officers and executive committee and i believe i don't know if bob it's possible to share that again um, yes, let me try here. It was a little quick, and then and then we're going to do a poll. Let's try and uh, do that. results in about 60 seconds here. Um, the, you should get an executive committee election poll coming across. Is it is it possible to show everybody that the, the nominees again, just for yeah a, a refresh? I don't want to cause too much technology at once. Perfect. So the exec committee is there on the left side. All right, and the, and the poll results are back on that. And we've got 20 votes in favor of the executive committee slate proposed by the nominations committee and no votes in opposition. So please let the record reflect that uh, the, the executive committee members displayed on the screen will are, are installed as officers leading the organization for the forthcoming year. So Thanks everybody for your participation in that before, you know, important bit of governance for the organization. And at this point, I will give the floor back to Chris. Eric, thank you so much. Also really want to um, uh, thank you for not only leading uh, the nominating committee, but also for having been chair immediately preceding me and for years of service to the organization. Um, Eric, as he mentioned, is rolling off the board uh, this year, along with uh, a few other board members, um, including Lacey Taylor, Andrew Ralston, Eric Marshall, and Hasiel Hiriart, um, who have in, neared the end of their uh, six-year terms. 
so a big thank you to those individuals. Um, again, these are these are people that put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to the organization, not to mention time, and we owe them uh, a huge debt of gratitude. I also want to thank another individual who will remain on the board next year, but who was involved in a big way this year, year and that was our program council chair, Giselle Puente. Um, she has probably been as involved, if not more so, than any other volunteer um, and is just a huge asset to this organization. Uh, Jitzel has some life plans that are going to uh, take her away from TGA for a few months, but she is staying on in the board, just not on the executive committee. And we're really thankful um, that she is staying involved and committed uh, as best she can, even if she won't be living in Tulsa for a little bit. So Jitzel, thank you so much. You made my time as chair much, much easier. A lot of other people to thank. They're still going to be around, so you'll they'll just have to put in one more year till they get the bouquet and the flowers and the whole bit. So, I now uh, would like to introduce you all to your um, incoming effective January first chair of the board, uh, Ruby Libertas, to introduce tonight's guest. Ruby, take it away, please. Thank you, and thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. We got you. Thank you, Chris, for leading the board this year and for leading us so well, especially during this hard time of losing um, beloved Kathy Isso. And we continue to miss her and we continue to commemorate her in our events this year. So thank you all for joining and thank you for voting and thank you for your confidence in the board, in the upcoming board. I will be writing a letter uh, really stating that it's going to take everyone to um, get us through this next year. So keep a lookout for that. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Alison Stoma, Senior Outreach Officer with the United States Institute of Peace. I have been collaborating with the United States Institute of Peace for years now. And so I really appreciate the fact that the board wanted to include this amazing, important organization, especially at this time uh, for this annual meeting. So. Allison leads the public education team's engagement of broad public audiences across the United States. Allison has 15 years of experience in outreach, communications, and public education with USIP, United States China Education Trust, Close Up Foundation, and Global Youth Leadership Conference. She has a bachelor's degree with honors in political science from the Union College and a master's degree with merit from the University of Glasgow focused on the role of China in the international arena, which we should probably have a talk on that sometime soon. Allison works with national networks and local organizations across the United States to inform Americans about USIP's mission and work. And so that is what she's here to do with us today. And so without further ado, Allison, the Zoom is yours. Well, Ruby, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to Bob also for the invitation. and. To, to, to TGA for inviting me to come and speak at your annual meeting. I know that there have been opportunities here and there to hear from some of USIP's either country or thematic experts, um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk more broadly about the United States Institute of Peace's role as a national nonpartisan public institute. Um, this is going to be a lot of background and sort of a general introduction to how we work around the world today. And then I really just look forward to a conversation with any questions you may have, um, ideas, brainstorming ideas that we can remain engaged over the coming year. Um, and so let me just dive right into it. Um, USIP was established by Congress and was dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. And that is what I'm gonna be talking about, sort of the, the areas of focus in which we work um, and sort of how we function as an institute. But before I get into that, I wanna briefly mention where I'm joining you from. It is our iconic headquarters on the National Mall in Washington, DC. And despite it getting a little bit late in the day, my background is very much blown out by the natural light. But just over my shoulder here is actually the Lincoln Memorial. 
Um, you know, our, our building and our location are significant. Uh, we think ourselves as being a presence at this worn peace corner of the National Mall. We stand in close proximity to memorials like the Viet Vietnam Veterans War Memorial, the Korean War Memorial, and even the Lincoln Memorial that talk about our country's sacrifices in war. Um, the same wars that you'll hear inspired the Institute's creation but we represent another important part of our country's story. And that is our country's long commitment to building peace. Well, some of these narratives can trace all the way back to George Washington himself, USIP's story begins more recently. It was the culmination of two decades of work inside and outside of Congress to establish a national institution focused on peace, a national academy. The leaders who worked so hard to bring USIP into existence were the veterans of World War II who had been deeply impacted by their experience, by what they saw um, in the communities that they served and their country back home. These are people like Senator Spartz Matsunaga from Hawaii, who was twice injured in Europe and North Africa, despite his fellow Japanese Americans being detained here at home and Mark Hatfield from Oregon, who was one of the first US service members in Hiroshima after the atomic bombing. They really took these experiences with them to the halls of Congress. And they wanted to avoid Americans having to fight other wars like that in the future. And they were motiv motivated by a simple but powerful idea. We have these institutions in our country that train Americans for war. You can go to the military academies. There are the professional avenues to, to be involved in um, the defense of our country. But at that time, we had no equivalent institution to train us for peace in very practical ways. So starting in the 1960s, these leaders in Congress, both Republican and Democrat, began to introduce legislation each year to create a National Peace Academy, sort of this top-down approach. And then in the 1970s, a growing grassroots movement from the bottom up accelerated these efforts um, because it was tens of thousands of American citizens who mobilized as part of a campaign for a National Peace Academy, adding momentum to this idea. In the late 1970s, uh, the Congress established a commission to study what would a peace academy look like, chaired by Senator Matsunaga. And it was a really thorough process to test the proposition. If we were really going to do this and create a new institution, what would it look like and what should it do? And so that's what the commission reported back to Congress in and ultimately became the USIP Act signed into law by President Ronald Reagan in 1984. It created us with the mission to serve the American people and the United States government by working internationally to resolve conflicts without recourse to violence. Today, nearly 40 years later, we work in a unique way, incorporating both the think tank and the do tank um, characteristics that you see across Washington, DC. The Institute has more than 300 initiatives in Asia, Central and South America, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. And then we have a long-term presence in about 16 countries around the world. And this work is really focused on four main priorities. The first one is strategic rivalry. What happens when great powers, when the major powers directly engage in conflict or competition or have proxy forces in regions? Um, and so how can we mitigate risks of violent conflict from happening? We also work on violence and extremism in fragile state. How can we help reduce the, this term we use, the fragility of a country by helping um, secure political security and civil society leaders and helping them manage um, their own internal conflicts nonviolently. The third category that the Institute works on now is what we call global shocks. So, how can things like climate change, things like the pandemic, how can you help build resilience against these, um, these unexpected occurrences by helping identify and establish um, systems or institutions that will help you manage shocks? And then the last one is the American approach to peace building. 
how can we promote U.S. peacebuilding norms and values in contrast to, um, to models offered by our other competitors like China and Russia? So those are the four categories, strategic rivalry, violent extremism in fragile states, global shocks, and the American approach to peace building. And so that's what we work on. And when you talk about how we do that, how we function as an organization, it's really through a cycle that goes from research, training, application, evaluation, and policy. So that starts with USIP thematic and area experts who really lay the intellectual foundation for peace building strategies. They do this through rigorous analysis, through on the ground research, and produce reports that are either publicly available or they testify before Congress or they're involved in um, public events and discussions here. There are also many cases where we offer high level strategic um, study groups and task force to look at very particular issues. So we take that analysis and then we focus on training. We've, we see what works, um, we, we come up with ideas that we wanna explore and we train people in conflict zones and also those in the global world through our USIP Global Academy. So anyone is able to go on to our online training system and explore strategic peace building, the role of religion in peace building, nonviolent action, and really get that training in how to do this work. That training is also applied and tested on the ground. And then we go in and we see what works and what doesn't. And we feed those conversations back into the policy discussions happening here in Washington, and also with multilateral organizations around the world. And those policy recommendations are then analyzed again and the cycle starts all over again. So that is the work that USIP is doing around the world on international peace and conflict. But finally, closer to home and core to our original mandate from Congress, uh, we are committed as a public institute to serving as a resource for the American people, um, sharing education and information about how international conflicts can be resolved without violence and how peace is something very practical, very tangible that we can work towards. My program, which is the public education program, has existed since 2011 and we now serve uh, and work with partners in all 50 states. So while most of my colleagues at USIP are working on and in countries all across the globe, our team is part of USIP that's working with people like you and organizations like TGA who have a demonstrated commitment to engaging your communities um, in being, in the case of TGA, citizen diplomats, um, but also exploring ideas about peace and conflict. We always are so excited to be able to seize these opportunities to talk to groups like TGA to share what our work is, but also to learn from you and see what you are doing and, and hear stories about how your organization is taking action for peace. And so that's how, what I wanna sort of end my more prepared remarks on is this idea of taking action for peace and how to remain engaged with the Institute. I touched upon several of them in my remarks, um, but I really don't want this to be sort of I come, I speak, and then you know the next annual meeting or another public event along the way, uh, you, you hear from somebody else at USIP. We would love to explore ways to remain engaged over the course of the year, um, whether that's arranging for more speaking sessions. I know Ruby had mentioned maybe a focus on China for one of them and having one of our Asia, one of my amazing Asia team colleagues come speak. Um, but you can also, I encourage you to go online and explore the global campus. This is a free suite of resources. Um, the courses range from three hour introductions to 20 hour in-depth deep dives on the issues that USIP works on. Um, if you happen to be in Washington DC, let me know, come visit our amazing headquarters building. We're currently hosting for the first time ever an art exhibit here called Imagine Reflections on Peace that encourages visitors to, in, to really explore through a multimedia exhibit. If it's so 
easy to imagine piece, why is it so hard to make it happen? And it does this by focusing on six different countries during wartime and then also during peacetime and some of the troubles and turbulations. And then lastly, I wanna put in a plug for the Peace Day Challenge. So the United Nations International Day of Peace is September 21st every year. And what we at the Institute do is we challenge people to take action. So organizations, individuals, networks to do one thing for us on that day um, and share it with a global community on social media. So we have everything from, you know, uh, elementary school kids doing pinwheels for peace to community discussions on an important topic to our Burma team last year held an essay contest on peace building in the country. So there's a whole wide range of ways to get engaged. And I think, Bob, I think I might leave it there and open up to questions and go in whichever direction people might be interested in taking it. Thank you very much, Allison. We really appreciate that. And um, I'll just mention on the topic of International Peace Day, there is a Tulsa company, and it's also one of Tulsa Global Alliance's corporate partners, uh, TD Williamson, that has gotten in touch with us to say that they are planning some kind of event on September 21st, and uh, they're open to ideas about what to do. Um, so if you like, I'd be happy to put you in contact with them. Yeah, that is excellent. So the United Nations every year establishes a theme um, for their for the day. This year it is End Racism, Build Peace. Um, but the Peace Day Challenge is a slightly different focus. And we are in literally in the final countdown days of determining um, sort of the focus of what we're going to be asking people to do. But the good thing about a campaign like this is it's about taking action that's meaningful to you. So I would love to get in touch with them and brainstorm some ideas. Thank you. Any questions from our audience? Please raise your hand, uh, put it into the chat or shout it out if you have a question. Okay, and Ruby has one. My question would be, how do you recommend organizations like ours with relationships with a country at war to continue the citizen diplomacy but not condone the war? Oh, Ruby, starting off very, very easing me into this. So I think, um, I mean, I, I think a, the more formal relationships are things that have to be evaluated based on other responsibilities and rules and agreements. Um, but I think one of the things, if you ever listen to, we have Ambassador Bill Taylor here, who is one of the leading experts in Ukraine. He served as ambassador twice um, to Ukraine. And at the very early on, he was talking about, you cannot, you have to be careful about mixing, exchanging the, a, a country and a, um, a government and a people. So what is happening? Is this the actions of the everyday citizens or is this the actions of their government? And how much say do they have in what those actions are? And I think it's a really important thing for us to keep in mind is the human element of it. And I think that's one of the reasons that citizen and public diplomacy is, is so important is because it gets down to that personal level that really does help you break down some of the stereotypes, the stigmas, the misunderstandings. Um, so not a perfect answer, but I hope it answers it a little bit. Yes, thank you very thank much. You. And that we had a similar question from Giselle. Let me just uh, read what she wrote and see if she has anything to add to it. Uh, one of the things we have addressed this year is the recent war in Ukraine and how to continue promoting our global community mission, particularly our sister city relationships, which includes Zelenograd, Russia, in spite of this humanitarian conflict. With the Institute of Peace promoting worldwide peace, what stance or action would be the most appropriate to take? Yeah, and I think that goes back to looking at your, your own institutional and community guidelines. Um, you know, I was talking with another national network that actually um, put a pause on exchanges and not because it was to hold any, to punish anyone um, or to punish their membership in this country, 
but it was for the safety of their partners, um, just making sure that to be seen and engaging in an organization to make sure it was safe for them. So those are other considerations. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. And then a question from Jane Waters. Do you have a mailing list we can join? We do have a mailing list. Um, I can put my email into the system. So we have several different types of emails and I'll talk to you about two of them. And if you just send me a quick note, um, I can uh, sign you up for them. So we do have um, two that go out every week that I would highlight. One which is goes out on Mondays, which is called our events weekly. One of the amazing things about USIP is our convening power. We operate in a very unique realm of, we are funded by the US government, by the United States Congress, but we're not part of the administration. So we have close ties to government, but we're a little bit separate. We do the, that think tank work, that policy analysis. Um, so sort of the civil society. And then we also do the work on the ground. So we have these characteristics of a nonprofit. And so often you see USIP events bringing together these really different voices and perspectives to talk about issues ranging from the, today we had an event on Afghanistan, um, oh, Afghanistan women, especially in the diaspora. Tomorrow we're having an event on um, Russia accountability for war crimes in Ukraine. And then next one, it might be a food security event. And so the events weekly um, shares what we have coming up and pretty much all of the, all of our public events are streamed live and we do our best to try and encourage audience participation through questions or other, other ways to engage with us on social media around them. So there's that one. And then we also, every Friday, we have what we call our weekly bulletin, which is the top analysis coming out of the Institute for the week. Um, and this is also where I think we bring a really different perspective because we have that presence on the ground and really deep expertise in these countries and issue areas. We're able to approach the headlines a little differently. And because it is one of the major headlines of the, of the year is the Russian war in Ukraine, is we have a whole suite of analysis that's not just looking at what's happening in Ukraine, but the impact that this war is having on Africa, on Southeast Asia, on food issues around the world. Um, so that weekly newsletter shares a lot of that information. I'm also very much a hand talker. So even two years into Zoom, I haven't adjusted fully to to the hand talking. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, let's see here. Jana Yoder, how can an organization like ours best take advantage of the online courses? What have other organizations found to be effective? So one of the great things about the online courses is by joining into them, you are joining into the broader community that is taking the courses. So we recently transitioned them over to a new platform that allows you to engage with, talk to, and communicate with other people um, to hear what their perspective are on the discussion questions or what their response is to a particular video or skill. Uh, one of the things we've done as we have built into the system is something called a community of practice where you can have um, a more contained group discussion. So maybe it is a group of, and this is entirely hypothetical, but a group of our Libyan facilitators would take the trainings and then they would have a private discussion group on the backside where they could share their analysis. So if there was interest in, in exploring something like that, if you think there would be interest in TGA or more broadly, um, would love to see maybe using you guys as a little bit of a, of a case study pilot case. Thank you. I think that'd be interesting. And then um, from Chase Beasley, he asks, what does your work look like on the ground outside the US? Yeah, I, I didn't provide as many um, specific examples as, as I usually do. So it really varies. So a lot of um, 
the work that we do is dependent on the particular situation and conflict that we're working in. But for example, in Nigeria, we might be working, and this falls under sort of the global shocks category. Um, we might be working with um, communities who are being forced into direct conflict because of changes in the environment. So maybe communities that are traditional herding communities are having to go further and further um, into traditional farming communities in order to support their livelihood. And that could naturally lead to conflict in an area that is already susceptible to, to violent extremism with Boko Haram and other stressors. And so we work with those two communities on trying to come up with ways to, to de-escalate the conflict. Um, in places like Iraq, it might be working with Sunni and Shia traditional leaders on local peace accords. Um, and then uh, recently, a program in the Philippines might be looking at the role that gender plays in conflict. So it is really dependent on the local circumstances um, and how USIP's technical expertise best supports what's happening. Is any of that work dangerous for the staff or there are there are risks that come with the territory, Giselle Puente is asking? Yeah, there's there's an inherent risk um, in, in the work of, of USIP and working in areas where um, there's active violent conflict happening or is coming out of a situation like that. Um, we do put the safety of our staff and our local partners, and I want to stress that, um, very seriously. We, USIP is a relatively small portion of the U.S. government um, funding-wise, but that work is amplified by local partnerships that we have in each and every one of the countries that USIP works. Um, so we're very aware of that. Uh, if you ever do have the chance to visit our headquarters building, we, we have um, a memorial to four staff who we have lost in the course of our work. Two were Iraqis um, who were killed in Baghdad in the 2000s. We have um, one of our rule of law team members from our Kabul office who was killed in a Taliban attack on American University. He saved his, his law students as he was teaching. And then another one of our colleagues um, got, got caught ill um, while working in Colombia. Um, so it is a dangerous field, um, but it's, it's in the nature of the work. Thank you. Um, Chase Beasley asks a follow-up question. What drives the specific programs across the globe? Do local leaders reach out and apply? I, I have a feeling, I, I feel like I'm giving a lot of it depends kind of answers. So some of our projects are application based. So we have a program called our Generation Change Scholars, which focuses on empowering young leaders from countries all around the world, um, young people. And by that, we generally use the UN definition, which is 30 or 35 and under, um, who are doing amazing work and projects, but are looking to connect with the broader community and maybe have access to some, some trainings and some resources that they don't before. So that does usually have an application process. Um, but oftentimes it's USIP understanding the conflict dynamics and then working with a local partner to see who are the right people to get in a room. So if we are doing a local mediation or dialogue, it's often at the recommendation of one or two or three local partners to say, those are the people that you need to bring into the conversation. Um, ultimately, the work of the Institute is led by our leadership. Our, we have a bipartisan board of directors that's appointed by the President of the United States, six Democrats, six Republicans, and then three members of the current administration. And they are the ones who select USIP's president who sets our policies. Any other questions out there?
Okay. Well, Allison, um, thank you very much for speaking to Tulsa Global Alliance today. We're honored that you took the time to share the U.S. Institute of Peace's mission and programs with us. Well, thank you for having me. Um, as I say, we have long enjoyed a great working relationship with TJA. And as I told Bob earlier today, hopefully, I know Bill Taylor was in Tulsa back in October. Hopefully we'll get back um, and visit and be able to do something in person soon. We would look forward to that. And we look forward to any other opportunities there might be to collaborate in the future. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, take a brief opportunity, a few minutes, to share uh, an abbreviated portion of Tulsa Global Alliance's annual report. There'll be a more full version of the annual report coming out within the next couple of months. But just to give you an idea of uh, our accomplishments during the past year, and Chris alluded to this in his opening remarks, um, there is someone here who's dearly missed tonight and has been dearly missed for the last couple of months by all of us. Uh, our sister city program coordinator and administrator, Kathy Izzo. And so we've decided to dedicate this annual report and many other things this year to Kathy. Um, as is written here and as Chris alluded to, she dedicated her career and her life to citizen diplomacy. And uh, we are all the better for it as an organization and as people who knew her. Um, for those of you new to Tulsa Global Alliance, this slide just describes our mission, building global community and the ways that we do it by hosting international visitors, by managing sister city exchanges and activities, and by promoting global business programs and global education. Um, one of Kathy's dreams, which I think she fulfilled very well, working together with all of us, was celebrating the 40th anniversary of the sister city program. This really began in 2020 but continued into 2021 with a variety of different programs. One of the most visible of these and something that's going to last for years and decades beyond um, now and all of us is uh, sister city directional signs. Um, we currently have two that have been installed at Tulsa Ports and the GRC uh, Business Park. And Carol McGowan, our development director has also been instrumental in accomplishing this. We currently have uh, full funding for two more signs, one in the Tulsa Global District and one at River Parks. And we're exploring locations for additional signs. And one thing that Tulsa Global Alliance committed to at our um, April executive committee meeting that was that we would fund a sign dedicated to Kathy at a location of the family's choice. And Kathy knew about this before she passed and we were very glad that we were able to get word to her. And here she and Giselle and Dr. Meshri are at last November's dedication at Tulsa Ports. We're proud to partner with Tulsa International Airport, which is continuing to host a uh, sister city uh, poster display, a poster uh, honoring each of our sister cities with a welcoming greeting in the language of the sister cities. There are two sets of posters, one for each of the sky bridges at Tulsa International Airport. And um, we keep hearing from people who fly nowadays, who've seen them and say how wonderful that they look. We were also fortunate enough last fall to actually have a group from our sister city of San Luis Potosi, Mexico, our first sister city dating back to 1980. I didn't put it here, but there's a photograph of them in front of the San Luis Potosi poster at the airport. Uh, they were firefighters visiting the Tulsa Fire Department and dedicating a fountain at the Tulsa Fire Department Museum. And these were our first international visitors since the start of the pandemic last year. One of the other ways that we recognized the Sister City uh, anniversary in uh, 2020, 2021, Marshall Brewing Company began the first in a series of craft beer releases celebrating the Sister Cities. 
And appropriately enough, they began with Mexico. A beer called Sister City Cerveza San Luis Potosi was released last September, September 16th, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, Mexican Independence Day, and of course, our sister city of San Luis Potosi, Mexico. Uh, we know that there are going to be additional um, beer releases to come. In fact, I'll get to that in just a minute, but there will be um, some uh, craft beer releases celebrating some of our sister cities at this year's Savor event. We've also seen a return to in-person programming for international visitors through the U.S. government-funded programs. U.S. State Department International Visitor Leadership Program has sent us four in-person delegations this year. There's a photo of European energy professionals at Williams from May, but we've also hosted visitors from India, Libya, and a multinational group of European documentary film producers learning about the Tulsa Race Massacre. And there's also a photo here of uh, a group of uh, Republic of Georgia delegates through the US Congressional Office of International Leadership at the Center for Individuals with Physical Challenges. We're expecting many more delegations of in-person visitors to come. If any of you are interested, we have an urgent need for host families for judges from Mongolia who will be in Tulsa July 16th to 23rd. So if any of you are interested in learning about the rule of law internationally or just interested in welcoming an international visitor to your home for the first time in over two years, please let us know. And these are some totals uh, of international visitors and where they came from during the last year. 127 international visitors virtually or in person since July 1st, 2021. World in a Box Day will be held in person this year at the Tulsa Central Library, Saturday, August 6th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., featuring hands-on activities to teach about other countries and cultures and entertainment uh, from many cultures with support and funding from the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies. If you have kids, know people who do, or just want to learn about other countries and cultures and get together with other people while doing it, please join us at World in a Box Day at the Central Library on August 6th. And we are also preparing for SAVER, Tulsa Global Alliance's annual food tasting festival, which will be held uh, Wednesday, August 31st at uh, Centennial Center at Veterans Park from 5.30 to 8.30. We chose that date because it happens to be Kathy Izzo's birthday. And it's one of the many ways that we continue to recognize her throughout the year. And uh, Carol, do you have anything you want to add about Savor to entice people to come besides the promise of delicious food? Well, um, it will be hot, yes, August 31st, but we promise a great conversation and great food and great entertainment uh, on the inside. So we hope everyone will come and we're just so grateful to our Current um, first three sponsors, you can see their logos there, the Verity family, Andrew and, Hannah Ra Andrew and Hannah Ralston, and CCK Strategies. So we still have other sponsorship opportunities available. If anyone on the call today is interested, just um, send me a note and I'm happy to get in touch and talk to you in more detail. But also it's important to point out our uh, tagline for Savor this year, Savor the Moment. And you've heard this a lot this evening, but again, um, this is with a nod to Kathy of how important uh, every moment is to each of us in our lives because we just never know what's gonna happen next. So um, please join us and um, you can go to TGA's website, look under events and then Savor, and there you can purchase tickets or sponsorship information is also there. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Carol. Here's a look at last year's Global Vision Awards Gala. We honored Oral Roberts University, John Harper, and Susan Neal. We are planning to host Global Vision again this fall. If anyone's interested in serving on the Global Vision Committee, we would welcome your help with that. And this is a list of our wonderful sponsors from last year's Global Vision Awards Gala. We continue our global speaker series this year. So far in 2022, we have hosted visitor speakers from Colombia, Tulsa travelers who've been to Ireland and Northern Ireland, and a speaker from the Czech Republic.
here's our financials. We're very grateful to our accountant, Leslie Melvin, and our um, treasurer, Caitlin, for keeping us financially sound. And um, here's our website to find out more about Tulsa Global Alliance. Uh, I'd also like to say a big word of thanks to uh, Libby Rowland, our summer intern, who's with us in the office this summer from uh, Carleton College. She helped to compile the international visitor statistics. And also thank you to Micah Keon for temporarily joining the staff this summer during his break from Holland Hall uh, duties. He is very helpful in uh, filling in for some of the duties that Kathy was uh, performing. And he worked closely with her on the sister city programs and we're just grateful for his wealth of knowledge and uh, getting us through this period. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here. Before we get to uh, the remarks from Ruby, our incoming chair, just like to say thank you to Chris Wiley, our outgoing chair for his leadership during the last year. We could not have done it without him and we appreciate his leadership of the board during this difficult time. And as a gift, I'm gonna hold it up to the screen. I hope it will show up here. We have a, uh, well, yeah, perfect. I was gonna say a magnetically suspended globe that rotates when you plug it in and Chris, just thank you very much for your service to the board. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, thank you, Chris, but he's not going anywhere, so he'll continue helping us. Um, and thank you, Bob, for reviewing uh, the past year. Uh, we know all of that was only possible because of your hard work, including Kathy. Um, and so, I think you also reviewed the year and mentioned events that are upcoming and the way, thank you everyone for being um, involved and participating today. And the way you can keep up with us is through the new Tulsa Global Alliance website. And so you can go there for events and the calendar, but also you can look at specific areas like global education or international business. And also subscribe to our newsletter, which comes very neatly explaining all the upcoming events. Um, really nicely done. Um, also, like they mentioned, Tulsa Global Alliance is excited about the new directional signs, sister city directional signs. And so look out for where those are popping up in the city. And so in the Tulsa Global District and in the river parks. Also, they mentioned World in a Box Day, August 6th in the downtown library. Please do promote um, kids of different ages. There's going to be uh, performances and booths from around the world, especially the sister cities, but also more than that. And we'd like a diverse participation. So we would like kids who don't usually are able to attend this to also um, be able to come this time. So please do help us spread the word. Also save the moment, August 31st at the Centennial Center at Veterans Park. And don't forget Global Vision dinner in the fall. Keep a lookout for the announcement and save the date and buy those tickets early. Also, like they said, the in, new in-groups um, from the US State Department are visiting from around the world this summer. And the one way you can help is by um, greeting them at the airport or hosting them in your home. And um, they're from different diverse topics, government, education, environment. And so we wanna showcase the best of Tulsa. And so you meeting with them and interacting and helping would be great. Um, also, I'd like to thank again, Chris and Micah, Bob and Carol, um, thank you all for all that you're doing and um, we really appreciate it. So if there's no other business or issues, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Is there any? Seeing none, we can adjourn. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Ruby. Awesome. Thanks, Ruby. Thanks, you're gonna do great. Thank you, Allison, again. <laughs>